Depending on where you come from in your theological tradition, Joseph could be a bad guy. Today we're going to unpack Calvinism and Arminianism and talk all about this debate. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're going to explain it all. Let's begin. Hey guys, if you guys here are little toddlers behind, here, let me show you. This is the contraption we got going on. We got the lights and over there, they're enjoying their tech time for the day while mommy and daddy film. We have been trying to film this video for so long that we finally decided we'll just bring the boys with us and we'll make it work. And we are gonna unpack Calvinism and Arminianism. So Joseph, can you kind of lay out what is Calvinism and Arminianism? So the big issue is God is sovereign, he's in control, and man has human responsibility. The debate is where exactly God's sovereign control and human responsibility meet. In the moment of salvation in particular, like how someone becomes safe in that moment. Yeah, for Calvinism and Arminianism, the discussion today, it's it's over salvation. So a very helpful picture that I was given was there's a mountaintop, a mountain peak, and God and his sovereignty is on one slope going up, and human responsibility is on the other slope going up. And it meets at the top, evidently, but there's clouds in front. And so you don't know exactly where it meets, but it meets somewhere. And so that's where the debate is, is in that moment of salvation, what's going on, what's happening, and where does it meet? Essentially, I tend to try and minimalize the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism on my channel because I think oftentimes people get really heated and point fingers and call each other heretics when in all reality they both use the same exact language to describe what happens when they came to salvation. The essence of the debate though is are we chosen before time? Like if God is sovereign and if he knows all things, did he then choose us? If we responded in faith to the offer of salvation, he knew that was gonna happen beforehand. That comes into play of like, okay, are we chosen? Are we predestined? What is this going on? Calvinists would say, because God knew, because he's sovereign over it all, he predestined, chose the elect before the creation of the world. Arminians would say, no, I had a choice in it. I accepted Jesus into my heart, that kind of language. If we're gonna like simplify it a lot, it started around when the Reformation started and this whole idea of by grace, through faith, just what scripture says, it's like, okay, well then what does this mean for our salvation? Do we then go preach the gospel if everybody is like chosen and elected? That is where we've kind of ended up today is we have Calvinists who would say that we are elected or chosen or predestined. And then you have Arminians that would say, yes, God is sovereign, but I had a role in accepting the gospel and responding in faith. Hey everybody, I'm wearing a brand new shirt that I got in the mail yesterday. It is awesome, it is fun, it's so comfortable. It's tight on the sleeves and comfy in the stomach. Tight on the sleeves, comfy in the stomach area. It's really nice, really good. Just a quick background, Joseph grew up Calvinist and I grew up Arminian. And then when we went to our undergrad and we both studied Bible at the same college and the same degree program, we're taught Calvinist theology and my seminary was Calvinist. However, I would not by any means say that I am a five point Calvinist. I definitely sympathize with my like Southern Baptist roots. At the end all be all, I use very Arminian language a lot of the time when it comes down to the process of receiving a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I say a lot of Calvinists do too. So Joseph, real quick, let's start with when it comes to election, I think it's really helpful for Arminians who don't understand why Calvinists would say we're predestined and it sounds so clicky and like we're chosen, we're better than you. Like, so why would they go preach the gospel? That's like one of the biggest questions I get from people that are Arminian and raised Arminian. Like, well, why would you ever go be a missionary then? All right, so first off, we do it because God tells us to. He tells us in the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel. And so that's the first thing that we're to do in this. The second thing is God hasn't identified, we can't see who is a Christian and who's not a Christian, who will be a Christian and who will reject it. The gospel is extended to all. So all receive the message, hear the message in some way or another, it's extended out. And so we tell people about Jesus with an optimistic mindset. Now, there's certain people who disagree in all areas of this. Yeah, that's probably an important distinction to make. Like there are extreme Arminians and extreme extreme Calvinists. If you hear some kind of like heresy or someone pointing fingers and saying they're heretics, that's the extremists. <laughs> right, like hyper-Calvinists, we don't need to preach the gospel. We don't need to tell people about Jesus. God's gonna 
make it happen. And so we don't know who's going to respond to the gospel or not. So we preach the gospel. We tell people about it, knowing and trusting that God will do the work through his spirit. Sometimes this gets like nitty gritty when you're talking about like sharing the gospel or when I'm doing like a children's message, you include like the elect or like, like they might not be Christians yet, but I fully hope that they will be. And I'm take the faith or the standpoint that with them being in church and a part of it, that they are hearing that gospel message. And I think in full hopes that they will be saved or will be a Christian one day if they're not already. And so I just take that optimistic approach and include them into that conversation, knowing that God is going to do the work instead of being more skeptical about it. You're not one of the chosen, which is how it sounds. Like I understand those who don't like the predestination idea because it sounds like I'm so much better than you. And like, I'm one of the chosen, I'm one of the elect, you know? So it makes sense. Well, don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, certainly. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 levels the playing field there. Like it's by grace you have been saved. And that can be used for Calvinists too. It's not like your choice or your decision or your responsibility. It's by grace. Especially if Calvins are claiming to believe that, then they also need to not think that they're elite or elitist as the chosen or better than anyone else because it's nothing that you did. Unconditional election is kind of like the formal theological term. And Arminians would believe in conditional election in that it was dependent on me saying yes. Now, Joseph, I would love for you to share the, is it an elevator story? No, the busting into the room story. I have heard many times growing up in my circles, you know, God is knocking on the door, open up the door and welcome him in. And Joseph, you would say. Yeah, I would say that it doesn't matter how much knocking goes on or what happens if the door is closed, you're not gonna open it because we in our own selves all have fallen short, the glory of God, none are righteous, no, not one. And so we're not gonna open that door. If God's knocking at it, we don't wanna be a part of it on our own selves, on our own accord. God draws near to us. He makes the first step through his spirit. So it's not just him knocking on the door waiting for us to respond, it's we're not gonna respond. So it takes his love and kindness to come reach in and grab us or come busting down the door and begin that relationship with us. And it's kind of this emphasis on total depravity, this understanding that like I am no good in and of myself. I cannot choose north if my life depended on me. That kind of idea. And Arminians would also acknowledge total depravity, but they would say that the Holy Spirit has done work on their heart to warm them up to then receive the gospel. Now this also plays into the cross. And so this is where it also gets kind of a heated debate because you don't want to mess with our theology of the cross, right? So Calvinists would believe in limited atonement. Do you want to explain that? All right, so this is like the touchy part, I guess like the most disputed or much rubbing heads with. Sandpaper part of Calvinism is limited atonement. So that Christ died for the elect. We get to hear a lot about Christ dying for everyone. And although his power is sufficient for everyone, it was efficient for the elect. All right, so there was nothing limited in what Christ did on the cross. It was full and complete. But whenever you take a look at the big picture of election, what is going on in the process, God has chosen some and he is saving those. Now the gospel call goes out to everyone, but if we're all fallen and if we're all sinners and if we all deserve hell and God's wrath, then it's in his infinite mercy and wisdom that he chooses some. There's certain instances in scripture where it says Christ died for all, and there's certain instances in scripture where it says Christ died for the elect. What are the gospel writers saying whenever they say all? The ones who mention it are in large part talking to believers or people who are believers already. And so that's in the midst of the debate. That's in the middle of it. Yeah. And again, I think it's so important for us normal people who aren't theologians or pastors being like quoted and speaking specifically behind the pulpit, for us to kind of minimize the differences because more often than not, it's basically the same understanding of the cross. It's the language by which we use to speak of the cross because it's the logical outworking of, okay, if you believe that Christ has elected those who will be saved, then yeah, he would only be dying for those who he knew was going to respond to it. It's the logical outworking of that belief. But they hear limited atonement, limited work on the cross. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I understand why people point fingers at Calvinists, but I definitely sympathize. I've been educated with my undergrad degree and seminary degree by Calvinists. And I understand where they're coming from. I cannot wholeheartedly 
necessarily ascribe to be a five point Calvinist by any means. And what that means is like tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, which we'll get to in a second, and then perseverance of the saints. So essentially you don't start with limited atonement. It's the outworking and the result of this lens that you look through scripture with. Because Calvinists really take this total depravity thing seriously, which Arminians also agree to too, they just understand then that we could never respond, yes, Jesus, if we totally are depraved, then there has to be logically, he's knowingly dying for a limited, elected, predestined few. My hesitancy is when it comes just, how do you explain then salvation? Like they they said yes to Jesus. So I've picked fun at you before because when you talked about someone like receiving a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you said something along the line of like, they accepted Jesus into their heart. That is technically Arminian language, right? Yeah, yeah, in some ways. You know, do that sometimes because that's sort of like the main line of the mainstream way of looking at things. And Billy Graham had a massive influence <laughs> in that area. And I have an endless amount of respect for Billy Graham. And Calvinists don't really have a good lingo to otherwise explain it, right? There's not like a good way to explain it otherwise, right? Can you think of one? Maybe somebody has something that's shorter. Essentially, with this video, I kind of wanted to demystify Calvinists and like defend my husband, like also while being a mediator, because I see how it sounds really selecting and we're so much better. We're the chosen and we're predestined. But one of the most beautiful aspects of Calvinist theology would be irresistible grace. And Joseph, do you want to unpack that? So irresistible grace is when God calls, we respond. So God out of his infinite love draws near to us. The Holy Spirit is working on our heart and our life and draws us to himself. And God is working on us in that process and is the means to which we receive salvation. It would almost be like what Arminians call like the Holy Spirit warming your heart up to then say yes to Jesus. Right, yes. And so the distinction is where as Holy Spirit would be warming your heart up to it, Calvinists would say that it needs more than that. So you're so broken, you're so totally depraved that it's not just a warming up of the heart because you are dead in your trespasses and sins and you need to be made alive in Christ. And so a dead person can't respond or be warmed up. A dead person needs to come alive again and God is the one who enacts that and who does that. And offers it and it's so good, it's irresistible. Arminians would say resistible grace. You can say no, you can resist it. And that's one area where I do have to differ with Arminians. I have known and experienced in my own life and in those lives around me when I've had the privilege of watching people come to knowing the Lord is that it isn't resistible. It is definitely irresistible. I would encourage you guys to study. There's a lot of good charts on Google. Like I printed off a chart just off of Google to help us kind of wrestle through because it does get really confusing and the languages can be so similar. But just knowing this difference will help you understand different denominations and the outworking of their theology. Ultimately, this all comes down to the gospel needing to be preached to the ends of the earth. It is our homework from Jesus to go therefore and make disciples in all the nations, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to go from Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But we can get so caught up in pointing fingers. Oh, they like this person. He's a Calvinist. Or they like that person. And he's da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And we forget that these are secondary issues. These are, if not tertiary issues, they're not dependent on our, usually, unless you're like some extremist, they're not dependent on your understanding of the gospel. And more often than not, we view them all very similarly. And you can be united and still disagree. Joseph and I disagree on a lot of things. We disagree on politics sometimes. We disagree on this topic. We disagree on women in the church. What else? Creation. Creation. Oh yeah, we disagree on that. And you can still be united and like love each other and have a biblical marriage, never mind, be united as a church and as believers. I would encourage you, if you hear people talking negatively about someone on the other side of the conversation, you know, or if you're on the opposite side and you hear horrible things about Calvinists, remember there are scriptures using language for both arguments. And that is why it's debated. It's not debated because it's absolutely clear in scripture, just like all the other secondary and tertiary issues that we see in the church today. But hopefully this gave you a lot more grace to give to your brothers and sisters that you might disagree with. That's right. The good news of the gospel, the power that it is that Christ came to save sinners like you and me does not need to be distracted by debates like this. If you have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that is all that matters at the end of the day. We can worship and join hands with people that we disagree with. And
and run the race that's set before us, we can preach the gospel to the nations, not because we have it all perfectly figured out, not because we're just joined with people that perfectly agree with us, but because Christ saved us despite us and he wants to use us despite us. Yeah, let's agree on Christ and the cross and him resurrected. Now, Winnie, can you say, if you liked this video, can you say that? If you liked this video. Say it really loud. If you liked this video. Then you will really like this video and point right here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you liked this video, then you'll really like this video right here where we discuss things that we disagree with, some really juicy questions to unpack and our theology around it. Go check out this video right okay. here. Check out this video. Say bye-bye, love you guys. Bye-bye, love you guys.